recently. <laughs> the weekly way. Oh, I can't spend the nose. Yeah, that's okay. Damn it. I was singing along a little bit. <laughs> Thanks, brother. Uh, take one of these top boys. Look at this guy. I'll grab us the jack in a sec. All right. Kevin Finger fucking flipping my brother McClellan. I missed you so much, man. <laughs> oh, we're going right into it? Dude, we're going right into it. I okay. mean, that's why it's running late. I'll get the jack here in a couple minutes once we're thoroughly involved. Excellent. Brother, I've missed you so much. I miss you too, dude. Uh, that wedding was a blast. I'm glad that you got down in the weirdest way. Once oh, yeah. I saw your weirdest. hair come down, that's when I was like, God damn, Kevin hasn't cut his hair at all. <laughs> nope. And he looked beautiful. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I told you about this, but I, I promised him uh, pretty much right after we got engaged, I'll cut my hair to whatever length you want for the wedding. But after that... You're fucked. I'm doing whatever I want with it again. <laughs> You're fucked. I told her last night at dinner, I was like, I'd like to grow it out and donate it. She's like, do you know how long it has to be to donate it? I was like, it has to be long enough to donate. Emily, I'm doing this. I'm like, <laughs> I believe I believe it's a, uh, I believe you have to cut off a full six inches. Which means Wait. it's going to be down to like the middle of your back. Really? I mean, if you want to keep it long. If I wanted to right. go to like a, a full short in length, I could get it down to like a little bit past my shoulder and bring it up to my noggin, right? Uh, maybe. I don't know. I've only ever seen people, like, with a ponytail, and they just, like... But that, maybe that's just for optics. Yes. You know, it, looks, it looks good when they can just, like, grab your hair and, like, get a get a big chunk like that. Well, imagine the sorting system where it's, like, what do you do for a profession? I get bags of hair in the mail, and I try to figure out if they're long enough, and then I try <laughs> to figure out what to do with it. Like, <laughs> making wigs out of human hair sounds more like a fetish than an occupation. It's absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. No, so, you're getting weird kicks out of that. Dude, for, <laughs> for sure. sure. <laughs> and it's such a beautiful thing to be able to provide people that. But you know there's some weirdos on that end. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Speaking of some weirdos, so you, you recently made this move to beautiful Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, yeah. Has it sucked the life out of you yet? Or are you happier than that, Rakev? Um, I'd say so, somewhere in the middle. Woo! That's <laughs> what we're talking about. Yeah. Ain't no bowl of Cheerios, but there's a couple honey nuts, you know what there I'm you saying? <laughs> oh, man, got my – hold on. There we go. It's kind of hard to get comfy on these this tool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This tool. I'm pretty sure these tools are going to give me scoliosis at some point, so I will be getting nicer Probably. chairs. Yeah, but <laughs> I, just, I keep sitting. You know, let that's me raise ba- this up a little bit. That's your base hunch, my, yo. I mean, yeah, my base hunch. <laughs> I'd imagine. Uh, well, so the P base is your your four string, right? You're playing it re- uh, relatively light. Yeah, yeah. Um, playing playing it light. Oh, like the weight of the instrument. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that that doesn't really bother me too much. Um. You know, I think I think all the climbing has my posture pretty, yeah, pretty intense. Pretty good, yeah. At least like you know, having a lot of weight on my back doesn't really bother yeah. me. What's it been like to find a new gym down there that you like going to? Um, it's been cool. I it just you know, it, as you probably know about me, Matt, I'm not a huge fan of change. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I, I spent a lot of time with you in the car trying to get you comfortable in different cities, man. I saw, I saw. 
<laughs> that's true. That's true. Even like even changing the height of this microphone once I grew accustomed to it was a little bit much. Uh, yeah. So I I think like. I always just I romanticize the nostalgia of of Cincinnati a lot. Yeah. Um, but you know, um, so the the climbing was the same way. You know, mm. I still I still think uh, climb time around here is like the best setting of any gym I've been to, the best layout. But it's it's solid, yeah. and uh, it's certainly. You know the reason I'm the reason I'm getting a belly is not because the gym is not good. <laughs> because well, I, I live in a bar, basically. Yeah, I'd like <laughs> to think that you're getting fed at least on these gigs. I mean, like when I see Supper Club come up on your Instagram, I'm like, I hope that's dank. I really do. Uh, so we we get a deal on food, but no, we don't. We don't get we get booze. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. And so I, that is food. They're feeding, that city. The, they're feeding us in some way. They're feeding our debauchery. Yeah. What, have you found that like in a city like Cincinnati, when you go to the climbing gym, you are someone outside of the the normal circle of work. So these people just know you as another guy at the climbing gym. You mm -hmm. have like a, a separate identity there. Versus in Nashville, when you go to the grocery, you're surrounded by other bass players. They're working the same gigs. <laughs> when you go to the climbing gym, it's other bass players. Like there's there's maybe not as many. There's there's still a lot of people that don't play bass that live in Nashville. I don't even believe you. I believe people come out of the womb and they're given three strings. They make their way to four. They make their way to five. They make their way to the sixth and they back up to five because you need restraint on the instrument. <laughs> yeah. You know, I I know I know a handful of people that own six string basses that actually use all the strings, and I and I'm not mad when I hear it. But there's <laughs> only a few, and I've met a lot of bass players. You need to be in such a reserved group. And I need to see you in a chordal capacity if you're gonna have six strings. Like, uh, is it Dirty Loops that did that awesome cover of oh, Baby? Yeah, well, that guy, uh, what's his name? On Honrik Lindner, Lindner, I, I think. Sounds um, foreign enough for how he looks. Yeah, I mean, you, you know the, you know the guy. <laughs> yeah. Crazy, crazy hair, uh, black fingernails. You know, like chain yes. necklace. Or, he looks uh, like he's an like AFI necklace. <laughs> I don't even know what that is. It's the band who sang Miss Murder. If you remember that song, Hey Miss Murder, can I? No. Quite heavy, but it's it's the perfect like. Well, I guess the Misfits is probably a better uh, okay. claim. Like yeah, that, I can that see that front V. <laughs> yeah. Front V. But I think to to play that kind of monstrous of an instrument in such a, a reserved part of the band, such a fundamental, do your job and get mm. it done kind of. Yeah. Uh, I really need to see you practice some restraint before you go plucking up there. Mm -hmm. What's been the weirdest? Um, what's been the weirdest musical change, going from Cincinnati to a major market like that? Um, well, I would, I would say it's twofold. Um, one, uh, in, in terms of music, like playing, uh, overplaying is simply not tolerated. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, you're done. Yeah. <laughs> like you do that, you do that once and like, all right, we'll call you. You can't. Your number's blocked. You, know, <laughs> even, you can't get a hold of this man ever again. You either change your number. Which <laughs> did you change your number when you got down there to have a Nashville number? Uh, no that that might have been that might have been clever. I might have fooled some people, but well, uh, I, I've heard a lot of people say that you need to have a Nashville phone number down there for people to trust that you're going to be spending the time down there. Like, hmm. I know there's kind of a glass ceiling. If you spend ten years in this town, then you start to get the real work. Yeah, I I don't know. Um, I mean that hasn't been the case for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I I feel like um, also also like being being from a place like Ohio, it's like not too far from Nashville. I don't think there's really like any prejudice there. Now, if you have a California number. There are definitely some folks that are just not going to like you off the bat. That's fucking. <laughs> That's awesome. become. Oh man, I, there's a. I've heard some stories of people with California license plates getting threatened at gunpoint in traffic, just like "go back to your state." You know, like it. <laughs> it's aggressive how much they hate California. Dude, it's imagine what that's like in Texas, like places that are close enough to really feel like they've been swarmed by them. Yeah, like Californians, yourself debatably included, are like yellow jackets. They serve little purpose also, besides to hurt you. Well, that hurts me. Kevin, you were there for long enough to know that you're a problem. <laughs> you made me a nice dinner one night out there, and I was like, I like him less. Then you came home, and I was like, fine, I like Kevin's back. 
no, you made us a beautiful tuna salad that night, and I was like, I don't know if I've ever watched Kevin make a meal, but I, he just gained a lot of love in my life. And then you played tablets for me. I was like, he's really gotten California. Oh yeah, like, this yeah. Is, this let my deep. let my hair down. Like put the dr- put the drone on, lit the incense, all that. <laughs> I drank the Kool Aid while I was out there, man. It, when was the last time you played tablets? Uh, actually, just a few days ago. But Beautiful. Before then, it had been several months. They're so out of tune, man. And like, uh, you know, if you when you live in Southern California, there are other people that play tabla who can like service your tablas and and get you new heads. When you're in Nashville, nobody has even seen those before. So. You want me to what? <laughs> you can't. You can't exactly buy like take the take it to a. a like a drum yeah. repair shop of yeah, some sort, like yeah, percussion there's, based. There's not going to be one of those. Well, <laughs> it's almost, it's like a drawstring, more of. It's like the the calf skin is held on there by one piece of the seam. It's not like you can go in and tighten a lug, you know. Yeah, no, there's no there's no hardware per se. Like it's it's all, um, it's very old school. Like I I forget exactly what it's made of, but they it has this like long string. It's almost like shoelaces. The way it's like laced through with this uh these straps and it's wild watching these like like nine-year-old kids like using the using the hook that you use to like put another strap onto uh uh i don't even know how you describe it they're these little wooden blocks um cylindrical blocks and you you put an extra strap on and then you loosen it as you need to get more and more tension as the skin stretches interesting um so but those are almost like, what you're putting the torque onto. Uh, yeah. So that's what that's what puts the the tension on the head and keeps the pitch up. Interesting. Is that wood like like dry, unfinished, or is it like seed oil so that the the drawstring can move and and, and tighten properly? Uh, you don't. I honestly don't think it matters. It's it's like they're very janky looking. I think it's just something for it to sit on. But, but you could literally break a string on one of these things. Like it's kind of a mind fuck that you could. Break I a mean. <laughs> I don't know. It's maybe possible, but like they're they're hefty. Yeah, you'd it's, have to do some shit to it. Yeah, it's it's like um, like like leather leather fringe if it was like really hard. Yeah, you know. Would you describe that as one of the the more difficult musical journeys that you've gone on? Um, I mean, yes and no, because like it never. I al- I always knew like I'm never gonna be good enough. This is so niche, and I'm never gonna be good enough at it. For it to be part of my job, it's just like very interesting to me. Yeah. So there is way there was nothing at stake. Um, I was so the pressure wasn't necessarily there. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's just so interesting with with that kind of thing. Like one thing I've noticed with just being a dumbass on my own drum kit, it's like you you give yourself a phrase to try to get comfortable enough in, and then you try to get to the nuance of that phrase. You try to get to the place where you can care about the dynamics of your hi-hat compared to what you're doing with your kick, mm-hmm. or just the the simple nature of how it kind of rolls over itself. And on an instrument like that, the way that you would walk me through the counting of it, you extend this phrase so far where you've almost reached a trance-like state. It's yeah. almost like doing the rosary for the it's, 15th time. It's like time. math you yeah. know, at a certain point. Yeah. And I feel like the way that kind of uh, comes back into your playing of you don't think of just the verse as the repeating phrase. The whole song is the repeating phrase. Like you've extended the way that you can put the the bookends on here and look yeah. at the composition. Well, I I hope so. You know, um, I I think uh, I've I've been meeting a lot of uh, specifically bass players lately who are really good producers, um, and you notice that in the way that. They, when they pick to put their their extra little flair on things, like it, it makes sense. It has an arc. It's not just they they feel an impulse, so they throw a riff in. You know, they they might feel that impulse and they they come up with an idea, but they're they're so um, developed as producers that they can log that idea away for later, like halfway through the second verse, and they still remember like what it is they came up with, and they're ready to plop it in there when they know it's proper interesting and do you think that's more of a practice of restraint or is it just like it's a zooming out thing um i'd say both uh i mean you've you've done a lot of production in the last few years i know Mm -hmm. um both for other people and just looking at your own compositions and 
reworking them, you know, finding uh, finding places for for horns and um, and strings and all the all the stuff that you've done with your last few records. Um, excited to check out the new one. Thank you for um, doing so. Talk some shit about the mix again. It's like it, it was <laughs> something that I watched you go through this with with our mutual material. I, I looked over your shoulder and I asked questions and I let you kind of deal with the internal turmoil of your compounding on decisions you've made that you're telling yourself you're sure of but yeah. at any point in time you can pull the the bottom card out from the deck and it's like the whole thing falls yeah, apart yeah it's oh it's maddening uh, the i other, don't really do it much anymore <laughs> the other day i opened up a session and i uh i saw that i had the s1 imager on the the outboard chain i don't have that plugin anymore and it's just weird the way that some of these choices just from a plugin are such a huge part of your understanding of the sound mm -hmm. and the picture itself so did it when you took that away did it just feel like you were playing you were listening down like a hallway it was super yeah. one-dimensional well because i didn't have it anymore it never initiated it was just like a red flag plugin right but like i remember the first time that you showed me how that kind of changes the depth of field yeah it's made me want to get that waves plug-in set again it's pretty it's pretty cool i gotta say i i still um i never i never got to the place of of like mixing ability to where i was able to really like build space the way that modern pop producers are able to do yeah where like the sound is is like it feels like it's moving around you do you, you know, find you... it in a lot of studios that you see like the Dolby Atmos thing where it's like you get that full like quadraphonic depth of field? Oh, like the the actual surround sound like yeah. mixing and stuff? I've only ever seen that once in a, a Capitol Records in L.A. Uh, and it was super cool, but I, I think it's pretty few and far between when they actually mix that way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I honestly, I haven't done enough session work down in Nashville to like to know for sure. I I did one at Ocean Way. Uh, it was two days at Ocean Way. We did a like bluegrass record, which was nice. awesome. And I was the uh, I was the idiot that like was trying to hold on. You know, I somehow ended up in this place with these players who've been doing this like their whole lives. And I was like, I can I can play one and five and be in tune. And that's about all I can do, <laughs> but it was enough, I guess. Yeah. Well, I think to be in there and to show them that not only can you do the job, but you can be uh, a positive member of the community. It's like when uh, there's a, a a guy that I watch on YouTube. I think his name's Tom uh, Budacek, or I forget how to pronounce. His oh list. yeah, that he's guy's the a fucking beast. man. He, he's a Cleveland monster that learned every rock and roll record he could. Uh, and now he does like these horribly produced iPhone videos where he just tells you the truth about Nashville sessions. Yeah. Uh, and he's well, a he pimp is at like that. top call dude. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like you see him and Guthrie Trap being in the room together for Billy Gibbons uh inauguration to think like the BMI like all You know of so much more about Nashville than I do. <laughs> no, I, I, I watch just my guitar player sphere. You're the one that actually lives that life. But I ain't going <laughs> nowhere. They'd have to drag me out. <laughs> But it's just – it's interesting to to watch a friend make that leap into uh, what we consider the highest standard of the industry. And we all have biases about it that are unconfirmed until you get there. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any light that you would like to shed of biases that you had before you went to Nashville about what you actually found? Um. Well, I – Hmm, that's a very good question. It's it's quite loaded, so don't feel like you yeah. need to go too in depth with it. Well, I'm gonna judge, <laughs> judge. My friends, this is certifiably straight liquid Sudafed. Kevin's been given <laughs> uh, a coffee that's mainly Nyquil. <laughs> All right. Well, this will get weird. <laughs> um, yeah. So I I think I think any anyone who particularly who is a uh, who is a side man because there there really is. Um, well, okay. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna try to take a more narrow approach. So I'll I'll just speak for uh, as as a as a side man, you know, as as just a player, because I I don't I don't really write. I don't have much experience in that side of things. Um, as a player, I I assumed, and I think most people do. You put it on a pedestal of like leaving Cincinnati, even though really there are players here that are as good as anyone else. Um, uh or at least at least players that on on average i would say the musicianship in cincinnati from the from the sidemen is as good or higher than in nashville on average mm -hmm. um you have you have so many people 
that go to these cities because we all romanticize it who who are coming from small towns like really small scenes where you know their high school band director told them they're a badass and they took that to heart and they show up and they still have in their mind that they're a badass and just so there there's a lot of people kind of who who don't have their their skill set together who are in Nashville and frankly they're still working cuz there's so much work there yeah um and, and do you find that those players tend to be in like the um... The more grueling gigging roles that you find on Broadway. Yes. And, yeah. <laughs> Most definitely. Which, um, you know, as much as uh, we can all look at those scenes and say, you know, it has its problems and it's it's not proper for the way that the musicians get treated, it's work that people sign is, up to do. It is work, yeah. And it, it's uh, such a particular entertainment district that we just need to be proud that in a country like this, you can make a living doing that. Mm -hmm. Whether you need to bust your ass seven nights a week or you can do it twice a week and that's enough for you. Yeah. Um, no, definitely. Uh, but yeah, that that was like kind of the, the fallacy that I found. And it's, it's sort of true at that top level. Um, you know, you have, you have the best guitar players in the world and a lot of them live in Nashville. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but that's such a small fragment of the scene. Like you're probably not even gonna run into those guys. Like you'd have to you'd have to know where they're hanging out and go out of your way to find them. Uh, but um, but yeah, like the the everyday gigging musician, which is the category I would put myself in. Um, I would say there's there's you know there's there's more players that that play at that at that high level, but the average person is just as good here you know if you look at the if you look at the the devin lays and the nick hacks of of the drum world you know the guy, yeah. guys are just just super solid and um you know they they might they they're probably playing like good number of wedding gigs and they're they're playing their church gig in the morning it's like you know it's the standard sideman fair yeah um it's just a bigger market and a larger gdp kind of a thing yeah there's just there's just more work and uh at least in some circles, pays a lot better. Yeah. Uh, but as far as like as far as the musicianship goes, I th I think we, um, myself included, kind of forget how strong the scene is in Cincinnati. It might be small, but the musicians are very good. Yeah. Well, I think it's um, it's such an important testament to make when someone like yourself can say that because everyone in this city is is proud of of you and your playing and your ability to go somewhere else and uh, really stand as a shining example of, you're going to do whatever the fuck you want. We've all known that about Kevin McLeod. <laughs> y you kill, you know? And um, when you look at something like Nashville, you'd imagine that it's like you need to play at the highest level to get these gigs, but it sounds like it's more that you need to abide by the don'ts of the gigs Oh yeah. because the do's are pretty simple. Mm -hmm. Learn the songs, get the charts, uh, be an easy hang. Uh, and hopefully as you learn new uh, standards of industry, if you ever did choose to come home, those are standards that we can learn from around here. Like mm -hmm. I, I've said to many people on this show, I want to see the GDP of Cincinnati's music scene rise so that more people like myself can continue to make a healthy living and have a family yeah. and represent the players and the scene that they want at the top level without breaking their back every night of the week in a bar that they don't want to be in like I tend to do sometimes. <laughs> oh, I remember. <laughs> I'm still here for I was it, there. Yeah, man, I was there right right there with you. Yeah. Uh, 20, 2021, I guess that would have been when most of that was going on. Yeah. Um, Are there any particular don'ts of Nashville that you've learned outside of the playing that are really particular? Um. Well, I, I think... Uh, um, I, I have been lucky that none of this has, none of this has bitten me in the ass yet. Uh, but it's, it's even more important down there to not talk shit because, uh, it is such an interconnected town and like, I mean here, obviously network is networking and, and just whatever you want to call it. Like having a, having a large circle of friends and acquaintances and is important. Um, and it's, and it's, you know, important as a human to not, you know, be in the habit of like bashing each other, especially when we're all trying to do the same thing. Yeah. Just trying to, trying to make a living, trying to make good music. Um, but in Nashville, it's like the, the gossip train is quick. Yeah. And, 
and it'll it'll get back around like if you've been mouthing off uh um i've had a i've had a close call before where i started to kind of complain about a gig that went that went wrong and i uh kind of caught myself in it when they started talking about a mutual friend that i i know also works with this artist and uh and i was like oh well if he's doing a lot of gigs with them he probably doesn't have this same issue and i should shut my mouth right now <laughs> yeah and, and that's a, a great thing to be able to learn because um there's something about geographically where nashville lays it's like as much as it is a huge entertainment district it's a small southern town where mm -hmm. you shut the hell up you don't talk about their god and you don't park in their driveway <laughs> okay yeah, you know you take your horse to my home okay <laughs> I don't need your newfangled fuel stinking up my air. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but I like it. <laughs> it. It's just mainly me talking about electric vehicles and my issues with them. I mean, I can't have cars oh, gotcha. running on double A's for the rest of my life. Yeah, well, just... you know, it's it's scary because sometimes you know you're, you're wandering across Broadway, pissed drunk, and you don't you don't hear that. Kind of <laughs> That's crazy. Can you imagine all these Ubers that imagine. are trying to have a new market appeal, and you don't realize that you've actually become a more lethal. Uh, objective to these uh, um, uh, bachelorette parties than we've ever known. I mean, yeah, the, not that you can actually drive on that street. It's just so flooded with yeah. pedestrians. I mean, but it does seem like the. I, I have a high respect for the um, the artists in our homeless community and what they write on their signs. Nashville has a oh, new yeah. level of that. Man, they're they're very creative. I gotta say. Yeah, it, I, they, it's a beautiful thing. You get to you get to know the regulars. Um, some of them are very friendly. Some of them, not as much. Well, before we dabble in the category of our favorite homeless, let me get us some Jack <laughs> Daniels because I have some things to say. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> Oh, a fresh bottle. Yes, this was a gift from Trying my father for my wedding. Uh, we're not going to finish it, Kev, <laughs> uh, but it's going to finish you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so let me tell you about a man. We'll call him Steve because that's what he told me his name was, but I don't trust that. Uh, Steve was always my favorite homeless guy down at the banks. Uh, it's not like he would listen to my sets, but he was always walking by and giving me a thumbs up, and that was enough for me. Uh, and he never walked up and said, hey, Matt, I need five bucks. He would always walk up and say, hey, man, I'm having a tough night. And then we'd chat for a little bit. Uh, he'd always offer me to smoke a roach with him. And I'd be like, Steve, <laughs> I know you found that. I'd rather not. Thank you so much. Yeah. You're a saint. I know uh, you found that on the street. Uh, I've, okay. got you, I've got you covered if, you, if you're exactly. that desperate. <laughs> I rolled him one doobie for his birthday once, uh, and he really – Never forgot about that and, and decided that roaches were the way to pay me back. And I was like, Steve, I really can't do this with you, <laughs> yeah. brother. Uh, it was super sweet of him. But one day, Steve just stopped being around. And I was like, I don't know what happened. Hold on. Cheers, brother. Cheers. You were missed, Kev. Steve just stopped coming around. And I asked one of the, the other delinquents that I love down there who, let's call him Mark, because that's what he claims his name is. And that's what people <laughs> know him as. Um, again, I don't know shit about these guys. Uh, I said, Mark, where's Steve been? And he goes, Steve's in jail. And I was like, for what? And he never told me. And then two months later, I saw Steve again. I gave him a big hug. And I was like, brother, what happened? And he goes, man, they took all my shit on my part apartment. I was like, you went to jail, Steve. I mean, like, that's what happens when you just don't come back and don't pay for shit for two months. Yeah. But I haven't That'll seen happen. Steve since, so I hope he has his apartment back. And if you're watching, brother, I love you, but I don't think he has internet. There wasn't much resolve to that story, but I do love that guy. That's my fucking dude. <laughs> but Mark is the one who always had the why lie, I need a beer. And it's like, yeah. oh, we've I seen, remember Mark. Yeah, yeah, we've seen that meme. It's not like he's being creative with it. Uh, but I saw but he a guy did live that. He, he embodied that uh, that statement. Truly, truly. And then he would get a tall boy every single night. I mean, mm -hmm. someone always hooked it up. Uh, but I saw a Nashville guy the other day that said, uh, I'm saving up for a hooker. Uh, <laughs> and I just couldn't believe. I think like, I've seen that guy. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't believe the size of the sign. I mean, like, it was such a proclamation. That I'd, I felt proud of him. You know, when you see a guy upgrade the size of his sign and look like, like a real winner for yeah, you. Yeah, like, he's, he's really, he's really, uh, he's really making that statement yeah. big time. It, it's odd to think that, you know, 
in, in our beautiful country, you have the freedom to live whatever kind of lifestyle that you want. And a lot of folks uh, in the high publicity homeless features, you know, the guys <laughs> who are rising to stardom, unfortunately, they don't care to do anything else with their life. It's like, and, and that's got to be fine by us, you know. Frequent flyers, I typically don't give them much more than I do in a given year. But I'll give them something because I, I like their friendship and it just is what it is. Yeah, I mean, they're, uh, oh, man. Yeah. Too many, too many thoughts on on this, but uh, they're they're all valued, Kev. Share, yes, share what the, you find to be the most PC. Well, <laughs> well honest, honestly, that's like that. That pretty much sums it up. Even though you were talking about my thoughts, uh, which trust me, they're not Never all PC. valuable. No. <laughs> oh, oh, I was gonna say they're not PC. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not that either. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think just like, um, you know, we have we have a huge problem with that. That we really to me there's very little excuse to have in a country with this much wealth but the very least that we can do is just acknowledge like all right if we're not going to solve this problem we at least need to and it's something that i know you do well even just hearing you talk about it but i've seen it too um we need to we need to just treat these people as part of the community because like it at least at least in part is our our city and our social programs that we all fund with our taxes failing these folks yeah so you know the least the least you can do is not completely ignore them yeah you know i i understand i understand not wanting to talk to the guy who's like is staring at the ground and just screaming nonsense like i i get it you you might want to look the other way with that guy you don't know what he's gonna do yeah but with the steves and the marks of the world that are just hanging out and listening to your music you know they're not hurting anybody totally well and, and their their plight has things that you wouldn't imagine are issues but like i remember a point in time where steve told me that he got jumped the night before and they took his bag that had his birth certificate in it i mean yep. this guy is you know, looks like he's in his mid nineties, but I'm sure he's in his sixties at some yeah. point. And it's like to think of how much that's gonna fuck your life up oh, for the dude, next it, month. It's impossible. Like it, it, I have a buddy of mine that, uh, you know, with with all of the um, conveniences of having having the internet, having like parental support, having a, a place to live, all all these things that we don't think about, um, having a driver's license, and like identification of various forms he lost his uh his title on his car and he's been trying to sell this car um <clears throat> but because he doesn't have the title he has to go back to the oregon dmv and they have to they have to fax something to the tennessee dmv but he has to he has to send in his id for that to happen so he can't really do that so he, he needs to at some point fly to oregon to get this all sorted out like, can you imagine what this dude is trying to go through with his birth certificate? He doesn't have an address to give them. Exactly. Um, like, how the hell is he supposed to confirm his identity? They're like, oh, yeah, well, well, we'll mail you something. Yeah. And then you send us back a check from a bank account you don't have. Um, no, we don't take cash. You yeah, can't exactly. Make, can't mail cash. So then you go to um, a predatory check cashing place that's going to take your 15%, 20% off the top, and then you're having to pay for a flight to go back to Oregon. Like, all the unnecessary hassle – of being caught up in the bureaucracy of people trying to make sure that all the checks and balances mm -hmm. are done right. It's like at a certain tier of things, you are really SOL for a long yeah. time. Oh, dude, yeah, just just losing, like with this guy, losing his birth certificate. Like, what do you what do you do? Like, he, just to have, or or if uh, if you don't have if you don't have ID, you know, if you're if you're trying to get government assistance, um, you know, like I I remember. A few years back, you know, it was probably during the pandemic or just after, um, I remember filing my taxes and seeing this, like, little $200 earned income credit, right? It was basically the government just gave me some money to say, hey, you're you're poor. And I'm like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't feel that poor. It, yeah, I mean, it was kind of sick. Uh, but, you know, I don't I don't feel that poor. Like, that 200 bucks was nice. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, um, as you know, I'm a very frugal guy, sometimes to a fault. Well, you are you are well buttoned. You you have a very clear idea of what you're making, what you need to make, and what you're spending. And there's a reality that you and I live in where salary is not something we're talking about. No. Uh, planned benefits, planned retirement are not things we're talking about. You come they from a be. family of, of really considerate 
you know, talented parents that went into spheres of work that had these things, and now they're watching two of their sons go through the the most unfiltered version of the free market, and it's like, <laughs> God bless, man. Oh man, yeah. But uh, if you're if you're if you're a young musician watching this. Start a Roth IRA as soon as you can. <laughs> yeah. Dude, Big I, fan. I, I, I'm doing mine for the first time this year. Perfect. And, and yeah. I was super excited about it. Uh, actually, let me tell you a funny story. I got the biggest tip of my life uh, after a 45-minute original set in the beautiful city of Cleveland from a stranger that I thought was uh, – probably too deep in amphetamines to want to take a tip from him okay uh, but this guy you know stood around for hours helped us load out were you were you at uh c bars i was not at c bars okay. thank god because uh, you know where that money's coming from. yes ex- no we were at coda you remember oh, coda i don't think i ever played there with you guys that was at small basement bar i think you did once but maybe not uh, but you know remember for, for all the times that uh you know, myself and many other artists uh, have stuck their neck out to say, like, I, I want to pay my players the the bare minimum, but what I know they're worth because I respect their time uh, mm-hmm. and I respect their presence here. So I'm going to lose money on this gig, and I'll keep losing money on this gig because I want to be out here making a dime off the material that I, I find most near and dear to my heart, mm-hmm. the things that I really have to offer rather than uh, Purple Rain for 15 bucks. You know sure. what I mean? Yeah. But this guy gave me... Uh, a sizable enough tip that I was like, this is it. This is where I start. Uh, and, and now I have a retirement account that now that I'm a married man, I hope to compete with my wife's 401k <laughs> one day because yeah. I could get in front of this shit before we had children and a home expense and all that and, other nonsense. And, you know, if you don't, just make sure, make sure you uh, clean the dishes. <laughs> exactly. exactly. I would be a great house husband, okay? That's- I could that's what I, hey man, we're, we're both, uh, we're both with nurses <laughs> yeah. and, uh, we know, we know where we're, we know where we're going with this and what, yes. what our, some of our responsibilities are going to be. I mean, gender she, roles are going to kind of go by the wayside a little bit. They definitely have. And, and I respect them both way more for that reason. Yeah. It's like you go through a way more grueling occupational status than I do. Uh, mine involves booze as a benefit and your involves uh, a retirement cheers. plan. Yeah, cheers. <laughs> yeah. So, so my liver uh, will depend on you and me for an equal amount of loving abuse. <laughs> 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 Hallelujah. Oh man. That is one thing that is, uh, that is so easy to overdo in Nashville. I mean, it, the whole town is basically a giant bar. Yeah. Um, and especially if you're if you're playing down on Broadway in the more ruckus bars, which fortunately I've been able to avoid uh, for the most part. If you're uh, you know if you're playing at Tootsie's or Honky Tonk Central, there's just waves of shots being sent to the stage, and it's like. Each one of these shots is probably fifteen bucks. It's like, man, you bought it. You bought a round of shots for the band. We would have rather had fifty bucks. Honestly, yeah. we drink for free here. Like, yeah, <laughs> and also the variety of liquors is the most violent part of the job. It's like, hey, if I told you I'm shooting Jack, I'd really prefer if you're gonna send something, send me Jack, because if I have to <laughs> switch between uh, a White Russian, a tequila a shot, uh, oh, a God. Jack dance. I was I was playing at the roof That'll last night. That'll ruin your night. <laughs> uh, th- this girl tells us that she's in the industry. There are three people. Well, no, four people. What me, industry? the bartender. <laughs> she tells me she's in the bar industry, and, and <laughs> yeah. we assume that she can drink like it. Uh, she was given a white Russian and then asked for a bucket. And the bartender's like, "There's a bathroom right there. As if I'm gonna get you a <laughs> bucket." For a bucket. Uh, she Ooh. she kindly bought a T-shirt later on, and then asked if she could buy me a drink. I was like, I just got married. I just saw you yak. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, I, I neither pre- of us need this. <laughs> I appreciate you buying the merch, but you know, if you're sticking with something, stick with something. And it's so violent when drunks assume that you're gonna shoot whatever they're having. I can't do another green tea shot. I certainly can't do another Jaeger bomb. Uh, <laughs> you know. Yes, you can. <laughs> I was given you a bottle of Jaeger for the wedding. Can. I will be doing those Jaeger bobs. You know, I'm not going well. right <laughs> uh, What's the liquor you've gotten most burned on through the years? Um, honest, honestly, like I, I don't find too much of a difference between, uh, between the various ones. I, I will say, uh, shout out to shout out to my neighbor Trey for uh, just absolutely ruining my body this time, this one time, but. Uh, uh, I guess I guess it was when we were doing a mix. There was this uh, there was this bar. Um, uh, I, 
I forget what it's called now. It's a bar restaurant in Nashville in a neighborhood called Germantown. Um, has a similar similar feeling to like uh, OTR, I would say, um, just north of downtown. And they found out that the place was closing. Management had hid this from the employees like for way too long. But the employees got wind of it. And they just called their friends and was like, hey, fuck it. They're, like, screwing us so bad. Like, you guys want to drink for free? Just clear out the bar tonight? Sure. Um, at one point, this guy puts down a bottle of, uh, I think, cognac and just said, here, pour for yourself. We got to get rid oh of this. Oh, my he's God. Not, he's not even giving me drinks. He just sits a bottle and a couple glasses down in front of me and my friend. And uh, so needless to say, left our car, blacked out. You know, next next day, um, I feel I feel great because I'm still drunk, and I I go to the climbing gym. I go for like 30 minutes. Like, maybe what I don't hero. feel so great. <laughs> what a uh, hero! Keeping hips and, tight to the wall, but has barely any <laughs> recollection of what you're grabbing. Oh man! But the the worst part is I had I had bus call at like 3 p.m. to leave for a, a short tour, like a little weekend run out, and uh, <laughs> the hangover set in at like 2 p.m. So I'm I'm in this uh I'm in this sprinter for five hours. Just I can't like I can't eat. My I feel like my esophagus has been burned from all the liquor just yeah. going down. And like the reflux probably starts to kick oh, in. So bad. Is I've never regretted a night so much. <laughs> <laughs> Cognac is also does not like a, like it's definitely not a serve yourself, let's shoot it kind of a deal. Like yeah. Like, give me a nice whiskey or tequila if we're going to go that route. But, like, that's the only yeah. way I can. I mean, he probably gave us one of those, too. Who's to say? <laughs> so, after touring at least with a variety of Nashville acts, what's the preferred means of transportation? Um, I mean, so I've never – yeah, I've, I've, I've had the offer, but it just didn't pan out. I've never done like the bus, the bus tour thing. The, the bus with the um, coffin rack. For... Yeah, exactly. With I, I don't think I would like it. You know, the only benefit to a bus is that you drive through the night. Um, hopefully, you sleep, and then you you wake up and you actually have some time in the city because, like, you know, touring is cool because you get to see a lot of places. But um, for minutes at a time, <laughs> that's the thing. Yeah, if you're. If you have to drive during the day, and especially if you're doing an open opening slot and you're chasing the bus, they might uh, they might have some like when we opened up for Blackberry Smoke last summer, uh, which was sick. Yeah, uh, there was there was one stretch of the tour we played in Long Creek, Canada, which you probably never heard of. Long Creek, it's, a, it's an entire province that has a, a less than a million people in it. Uh, so it's p- less populated than Cincinnati and about the size of Oregon. <laughs> uh, so we, we played out there at this venue called the R10, which is a highway. Uh, so we basically just get off the highway, drive into this field. Oh, my God, it's so ridiculous. Our our, uh, our green room was a trailer with no AC. Oh. Um, this is, I mean, it, fortunately, we're way up north in Canada, so it wasn't too bad. But, you know, this this guy with these, like, Oakley sunglasses rolls rolls in, you know, uh, talking to us like, "Hey, hey guys, how you doing? Uh, <laughs> welcome to welcome to Canada." Eh? And, you know, uh, we we got we got a little a uh, uh, little welcome gift here for you. He hands us like twenty pre rolled joints. Nice, like it because he knows <laughs> that we couldn't bring our weed across the border, uh, or you shouldn't. Yeah. Um, Amen. And uh, <laughs> yeah. and. We're there for like twelve hours. <laughs> We're not gonna smoke all these. Yeah. But we went through as much as we could. Uh and anyway, the the story the real story of this is we, we played there, uh just north of Nova Scotia, and then two days later we played in Fort Wayne, Indiana. <laughs> so like that was how wild this routing was. And you know, if you have a professional bus driver to do all that for you, it's one thing, but uh we just had this dude, Los, who is who is awesome uh great driver ha- never runs out of energy but you know he's still he's driving this sprinter across across the country just like you know um nah i won't say that throw him under yeah. the bus but but it, it, it's a yeah. tough thing like you know I, you and i had always been in, in cars together where one of the four of us is going to be driving and we're driving in shifts it's like Everyone feels a little uncomfortable at times with whoever has to drive because they know the 
the severity of what they've been going through. Yeah, and just like how tired everyone is yeah. by the end of the run. <laughs> Versus in Nashville, you have folks that literally are professionals at this thing, but the lifestyle of one of those guys is so brutal. I mean, yeah. it's caffeine pills and pilot coffee. Uh, and and they live. And it. then you don't want to know what else. Yeah, exactly. You don't ask. <laughs> Tube socks and slip-on s- sandals. You know what lot I mean? Like, yeah, lot <laughs> lizards. Well, I mean, how do you expect to fill your cup emotionally? I fill mean, everyone cup. needs love, Kev. <laughs> fill your cup emotionally, physically. Exactly. <laughs> but you know what else? They're filling cups. Let me, let me tell you. <laughs> Full cups. These guys are backed up. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tough lifestyle, man. And I really wonder, uh, you know, what's the kind of person that moves to Nashville and looks for that type of role? Because it seems like most of the, you know, there's there's artists, there's sidemen like yourself, there are distinguished players that serve those roles. And then there's a lot of people that tried to be one of the two of those that then filled in the the button-pushing kind of positions, whether mm-hmm. you're accounting at a small label or you're printing CDs and records and selling merch, or you're driving uh, a CDL Class A vehicle yeah. <laughs> through the night for days on end. <laughs> it's nuts, man. And, and one day you wake up and you're 75 and you still haven't made that much money. And it's like, my God. You know, I think you'd be surprised at how much these folks are making. Really? Um, oh, yeah, especially the bus drivers. I mean, the so the, you know, for, for you folks that are wondering about nashville and how much money you can make on the road the going rate right now is somewhere between 200 and 250 a day um which uh you know might might feel like a lot of money but when you when you do the math of like how much you'd have to be gone and like the travel days in between which sometimes you get paid for sometimes you don't uh it's really it's it's not enough to or it it's barely enough to live on as a uh, as a single person, you know, in your in your 20s and as you get more expenses and you're buying insurance and you're trying to save for different things, it really it really is not sustainable to just do that. Uh, but the bus drivers on the other hand, they're they're probably making 350 400 a day. Mm. Uh, so if they're if they're okay with living that lifestyle, um, you make, you know, you're out 200 days of the year. That's 80 grand. Yeah, and you tend to live on a per diem kind of basis where you're getting a meal. Do they sleep on the bus when everyone else is at work doing the thing? Uh, no, there's there's usually a hotel room for the driver. Nice. Uh, so you know, so he can have some like blackout curtains and whatnot. Yes. And, and get some sleep. So I can't uh, imagine calling on your system to conk out after you've been so attentive, staring at the wheel, yeah. driving this you know multi ton uh, vehicle. I, I couldn't do it. Full. Of, Speak to this. I, I'd imagine that the the job only gets <clears throat> truly better when you've earned the loyalty and respect of an act that you can spend a career with. So if you can find someone like like a Taylor Swift that started off as a 15-year-old that barely had the budget to make sure that you had that job, and mm-hmm. then you become the trusted driver for that family, and you're always there, that becomes a dream job at some point. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um you know, I, I feel like I can't really speak to that because I I haven't I've I've always um just because I'm a homebody, I've I've done much more of like the local stuff and and you can sort of stack that up more as you know. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, you can kind of stack that up more easily. Uh your schedule's a little more flexible. Um and and you know, I, I uh for better or for worse, like being in your band, frankly, is the closest I've been to like truly being in a band and even then i like i wasn't playing bass all the time it's just like yeah i mean maybe maybe three quarters of the time yeah I, i'd um, say you took 75 percent of the work during your your heaviest in stint that, in the band. yeah in that like year year and a half period yeah uh but i think you know within that we get to carry a different culture in the band here because it is a smaller market and mm-hmm. as much as it is a roster of guys that are very capable and know the music it's like your thumbprint is very appreciated and beloved in a band like this versus when you go to Nashville, you're kind of asked to scrub your your distinguishment from the music and Sometimes, just yeah. do the thing. Like yeah. I'd imagine, especially in the high-ranking guitar player field, we're not asking you to sound like yourself on your instrument. We're asking you to sound exactly like, like the record. They want you to sound like the record, yeah. Um, especially, I'd, I'd say with rhythm sections, especially, that's that's the case. Uh Maybe as a lead guitar player, you have a little bit more freedom to 
to truly have a voice. Uh, but it, it all depends on the act. I, I think like the more you, like you were saying, the more invested you've been uh, for longer, the more you people will give you that leeway because they, they trust you to do it. But um, for example, I have a, uh, a friend of mine who, who plays guitar with Rachel Horder, who's the main artist I work with. Mm. Uh, uh, this guy, Luke DiGiuseppe. Um, he's also a great, great bass player. It's a great uh, last name, too. I know, yeah. It's, it's open a restaurant, brother. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but, I, and it's Luke L-U-C, too. So it's nice. It's full-on foreign-sounding looking. <laughs> uh, but he plays bass with a band called Tiger Lily. Um, I heard of Tiger Lily. Yeah, man. Killer band. They're doing really well. I think they just were on the Today Show yesterday. Fuck um, yeah. Congrats. But like, uh, oh, yeah, they're crushing it. Yeah. Um, and... Oh, what was I gonna say? Yeah, Luke. I was asking Luke about, you know, his his setup because I'm trying to trying to get my pedal board together, getting everything to sound and just just so. Yeah. And he and he was like, yeah, you know, I, I have this have this compressor that I need because we have a stripped down version of the band and we run tracks to make it sound more full. But I need my bass to just sustain forever until I stop fretting. Yes. Um. And uh. And he said, yeah. Well, that's just what the record does. And they, you know, we run we run it to a click. They want like the singers, uh, the two lead girls, fantastic vocals. Uh, they want it to feel like the record because that's how they're the most comfortable and are able to deliver the performance that they want. Uh, so yeah, Luke is Luke is playing pretty much the same part every night. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I mean it's it's honestly it's it's really cool. It's like a it's a unique challenge that we probably don't do as much in in a town like this. Yeah. Uh, but where where there's more like true bands, you know, like uh, versus versus an artist and then whoever they decide to hire for a tour. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Like with with you and the band was probably the closest we ever got to true meticulous fashion of start to end. This is how we run it. Are are the three Sorry parts about tight? That. No, you were, <laughs> Kevin. You were such a, a, an amazing member of this band, and you always will be a part of this band whenever you want to come back and be uh, a part of this band. But at any point in time, we're going to call to go into the weeds and have a good time. Uh, and I like to think that Nashville has the players and the capacity to do that. But most of the time, it's the length of the set in some of these fashions that's like. 25 minutes is 25 minutes. Yeah. And if we go off script, then we're going to end up at 2730, and that doesn't work and out then, here. And then the uh, yeah, and then the headlining act, their tour manager will come up and chew you out for 27 and a half minutes. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> that actually happened to us the first the first night of uh, of the tour with um, uh, with Blackberry Smoke. We went about 90 seconds over, and this guy was livid. That's tough. It was the only time we went over the whole tour, but he like he came up to us like to to the band and really chewed us out. And El Elizabeth Cook, who was the artist I was out with, you know she's got she's got a lot of clout. She's she's been around the block for a long time, and when she got wind of that, she <laughs> she laid it down with this guy. He's like, hey, you can't talk to my band this way. Yeah. And from then on, he was like super cool and nice. But I think he, you know, tour managers are have to kind of be the hard ass to keep the ship running while everyone else is partying. Yeah, I mean, someone has to play the bad guy. And in a market like this, where I'm the band leader, and unfortunately I'm the one playing the routing, and I'm putting <laughs> the money up for a hotel, it's like sometimes I have to look like the bad guy, and I don't do a really good job of wearing that hat, versus you're paid as a tour manager to be the one that lays down the law, that yeah. gets things done on time, that collects the cash at the end of the night, that does everything that a type A uh almost unincluded party would do you're you're yeah. the arbitrator of this deal you're the you're the parent yes <laughs> you're the parent of a bus full of children yeah and <laughs> if you're good at that type of role i mean those are ceo type people that are very they capable. make a good living doing that yeah and they should mm -hmm. uh but it, it's just so interesting to see the way that uh when you have uh, a market of that size the standards of industry define these roles much clearer then if you have a band out of Cincinnati that has a tour manager, it looks like what our band does, where it's like yeah. it's just a buddy that's wearing the hat and he doesn't know what he's supposed <laughs> yeah. to do. And he's he's hanging out, he's hanging out and carrying on just as much as we are. Exactly. So I'm probably gonna still be the one to collect money, and I'm hammered at the end of the night. It's like 
there, there's a particular gig that I've been trying to get back that we played up in the, the Arlington area. That like I, I oh I remember that club. I love yeah. this gig, but it was great. I got too turnt to tango, uh, and I probably made a bit of a fool of myself oh, at the end no. of the night. Is so, that- <laughs> so I haven't gotten the gig back. But when you have someone in that role, you don't have to worry about too turnt to tango. You can yeah. just have a good time and let it right. fly. And then the other the the person the person wearing the so so called suit and tie. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's probably not a suit and tie it's a staff t-shirt with the same logo on the back you know? <laughs> yeah oh the staff t-shirts i forgot the band blacks oh you yeah know? uh yeah that guy that guy can be your professional front yeah so it's still everything still looks all buttoned up and then you can kind of do whatever exactly uh what's it been like to relearn um a comfortability with turning down as much work as you probably have to turn down in nashville um well i'd say i'd say i'm still in a position where at least at least with original gigs like i i definitely uh maybe more so now than six months ago uh i'm definitely still taking like whatever i can Mm -hmm. um just like and sometimes that means i have a very grueling day like i did uh i did a i did a triple um which in in nashville is usually three four hour gigs uh with hardly time to eat yeah (laughs) in there uh, I did a triple once on a on a Friday, you know, starting at 10 a.m. Uh, I think I did like 10 to 2, uh, 4 to 7, and then 8 to midnight or something like that. Christ. Um, yeah, it was ridiculous. <laughs> Just absolutely wrecked myself. But uh, you know, it's it's kind of worth it for to me right now. Um, I have I have a, I'm very fortunate to have a lot of good paying, steady work. Uh, with just a, a handful of artists, but the more you do that in a town like Nashville, people just forget about you, mm. and they're like, "Oh yeah, Kevin's doing like that thing." So we're not, you know, you're not you're not going to get calls to do new things unless you're like around. Yeah, because there's so many people moving there. There's so many people like coming off the road. You know, you everyone gets fired from a gig eventually. Uh, so you know, somebody somebody loses a gig. I mean, it's happened to me. Yeah. Uh, everyone loses a gig at some point, and then they and then you're back in the scene, and you're like hanging out. You're like professionally cool. Yeah. You're hanging out. Uh, and what's that look like? Going to the clubs where you see players that you admire, and you're you're listening with folks that are in your peripheral and can offer you work that they had to turn down. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's especially for bass players. That's like the way to do it. Yeah. I mean, I get. And and have uh, gotten over the course of being there, probably seventy five percent of my work was funneled from another bass player, and then that person got too busy, and I I either took over the gig or just was subbing it more and more. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but I I think it's it's the same as anywhere, you know. Like you you go out and you show you show support in the scene, and people will support you. Yeah. Uh and it's it's really based upon that. It's a very communal place. LA is a little you kind of have to like you have to strong hand a little bit. Yeah, you have to fight for the work a little bit more there. Yeah. Not that uh not that you can't find your circle and then they'll all help each other out, but it's so oversaturated with players compared to the amount of work there is that you know, somebody who doesn't know you well just because you're a good player, they're not going to give you a leg up. Yeah. Uh Whereas in in Nashville, I think if you're a if you're a nice guy and you take someone out for coffee or lunch, and just to pick their brain a little bit, they'll remember that they'll appreciate that. And you know, if they ever can't make a a shift or something downtown, like they'll they'll throw it your way. And if you do well, they'll throw more your way. Yeah. Well, it, it's again, there's standards of industry that you need to look at and evaluate whether they're things that you would like to reinforce in your own hometown or not. Uh, and I want to see Cincinnati's scene grow to have uh, the type of industry that respects each other, that supports each other, that mm-hmm. says any bar that's willing to put up a, a space for the stage deserves to have great acts to help the bar make money. Mm-hmm. Those acts deserve respect. Those acts deserve listeners. Like, above all things, if you came out to see my show tonight, I want to tell you about more great music that you can see tomorrow night. So you don't have to come see me again. You can go and feel like you're – your dollars and your time are worth c- committing to local mm-hmm. music. Yeah. I mean, there's there's so much, like I was saying earlier, there's uh, the standard of talent and musicianship here is 
is on par on par with just about anywhere else. Um, you know, they they might not be as well known, but like, damn, they're good. <laughs> Because there is a lot of work in this town per capita, yeah. Uh, and um, yeah, I, I would say add add another thing to that, um, which is uh, <clears throat> if we want that standard to continue to increase, the only and and if you want to be able to make a living, the only way that that will happen is if musicians are are willing to turn down gigs where, you know, there's there's a new bar that opens up, they want to have music, they can't afford music. And they need to know that, and and that's okay. Not every bar can have music, but uh, especially if you're somebody who's trying to make trying to make a living doing it, uh, the more often you say yes to seventy five bucks. I know, like, I know twenty five bucks an hour is like solid if you're working a forty hour week. You're not gonna well, unless you're Matt Waters. You're not gonna work a forty hour week in music, like forty hours of playing. So yeah. you you have to take that into account. Uh, when you when you set your rates and and uh, you know a hundred bucks was what people were making in Cincinnati in the eighties and it it shouldn't cut it anymore so yeah. we we have to collectively uh, you know remind each other that we because we don't really have a union yeah. at least not a, a that, strong enough one to make much of an impact in pricing for like everyday bars and stuff like that yeah and if you're in the position to tell people that you're worth more. You should tell those people that they're worth more mm-hmm. uh, because I think there should be introductory gigs that maybe they're not the highest caliber, but it's a chance to stick your neck out yeah. and try your best. Absolutely. Uh, but there needs to come today a day to cut ties with that and say you deserve better. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that happens through the same kind of affirmation that you gave me as, as a fellow player. I, I really have uh, a lot of love and appreciation for all the ways that you affirmed uh, my worth my work ethic, yeah, uh, and and what I want to do in this, and to see you leave the city <clears throat> and excel in the ways that uh, you have, uh, fills me with a lot of pride and gratitude for your presence in my life, brother. Oh man, I really appreciate that. You're the fucking man, Kev. <laughs> Give me that five. Oh, you sweet man. All right, <laughs> before we wrap up, tell them where to find you. Tell them where to follow. Um, let's see if I can remember this. Uh, you can look it up if you need to. You can <laughs> no, show I think, the... <laughs> I think it's uh I think it's Kevin dot McClellan dot base. Pretty straightforward. McClellan spelled M C C L E L L A N. Hey, you got it. I remember writing these checks. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah, and um I I don't have a whole lot on there, but you should be able to get a sense of what I do. Yeah. And uh Hit me up. Yeah, with my highest referral, all Kevin for your remote tracks uh, and and maybe feet picks if he ever starts to dabble in the category. Nadia, oh, yeah. remember I said that high class, <laughs> high caliber, beautiful tootsies. I love y'all. Peace, players.